Hey guys, this is Dr. Tom Hagopian with Peachtree Plastic Surgery, and today I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, let's go through and just, instead of having a specific topic, we'll talk about stuff like that. I thought it'd be more interesting uh, to, to just kind of go through Reddit, and let's just answer some Reddit questions. Let's learn a little bit about it, a little bit about everything. We can make comments on some of the crazy things we see on there, um, but mostly just answer questions that you guys are asking on the r slash plastic surgery subreddit. What do we have here? So I have my laptop in front of me, in case you guys didn't know. Let's find a good one. Okay, here's a good one. This is posted by u slash loudtip5474. Doctor botched my nose, but is in denial and refused to remove my implant. This is a 24-year-old female. She talks about having a big, flat, bulbous nose, and, and this is pretty typical rhinoplasty stuff. Growing up, I was always self-conscious about it to the point that I decided to finally get a rhinoplasty. I initially told my doctor I wanted ear cartilage, so she went through uh, the normal process and just put a little bit of a bridge on my nose. And here's the paragraph. It, it's my three-day post-op today, and I know it's too early to tell, and I'm still swelling, but I can already tell that my nose is definitely botched. So we're just going to stop reading right there because she's three days post-op. Let me just tell you, you cannot tell if something is botched on three days post-op. You are so swollen, it looks so different than it will look when you're done that you should just not even look at it or consider a result because it's just part of the healing process. After you leave the operating room table, everything gets so swollen that and everyone heals so differently that it just looks like a completely different part of the body, particularly the nose. The nose actually starts to get swollen while you're on the table if the procedure goes too long. So there's no way that you can tell whether, what your result is going to look like on post-op day three. You just have to wait. This is the hardest part about, one of the hardest parts about being a patient is looking down at results, you're expecting to see something, and you just you have to wait because it's all swollen and bruised and this and that. It's hard as a surgeon too because we know what it's going to look like eventually, but it's it still is you know doesn't always come out the way we like. And so when we see someone healing that's really asymmetric, uh, it can be a little nerve wracking. Even though we know that the asymmetry is just part of healing, but this is especially common in rhinoplasty patients. Don't look at your results until at least three months. That's when you should really start critically evaluating your results. She posts an update to this. She said that I consulted with a reputable surgeon in my area online and he said that the tip of my nose definitely looks infected. He could either change my antibiotics to a higher dose or remove the implant to avoid any further complications. But he did warn me that my nose might look bigger because of the scar tissue that would form inside. It's really hard to tell online if something is infected. Now, looking at her photos, they basically show a little redness and some a pustule on the tip. A pustule is just basically a pimple on the tip of the nose, and it's entirely possible if it's infected, but it's not something I would call infected without examining the person in person. And that's probably not something I would recommend to do as another surgeon if somebody else just operated on a patient. So if this were somebody who was asking for my opinion, I would tell them they should probably talk to the surgeon that placed it, uh, especially if it's three days post-op, because they know what they did. They know exactly how the surgery went. They're intimately familiar with this patient's anatomy and this patient's personality. Um, and they'll be the ones better to address these issues. Okay, so that's a little post-op rhinoplasty. A, a lot of the posts of rhinoplasty on the r slash plastic surgery subreddit are like this. They're people very concerned about how they look immediately after surgery, um, which is understandable because it's such a prominent part of someone's face and even for people's identity with time. All right, so moving on. So the next one is by u slash taro short 12, and she says, post breast dog prep. Hey y'all, I have a breast dog next week, two hours away from where I live. This is super common, traveling two hours for surgery. Not unheard of at all. Most people, a lot of people travel much further than that. There's a hotel right next to my surgeon's office. The day after my surgery, I have a post-op appointment check-in. I can't decide if I want to stay at the hotel, which will give me peace of mind if I did, have any unexpected complications, because I'll be in the same city as my surgeon and will save time. But I'm thinking it also might be nice to be home in my own bed. Anyone have a breast dog? So she's basically asking about traveling for surgery. 
So if you're traveling within the country for surgery, within the United States, and you're traveling uh, within a driving distance of surgery, it depends on the procedure you're having. Some procedures and the distance you're driving will put you at an increased risk of a blood clot. And you don't necessarily want to be in a car for a long period of time immediately after surgery, especially if you have a lot of risk factors for blood clots. So things like anything with an abdominoplasty puts you at an increased risk of blood clotting. If you also are a person who's had a blood clot in the past, have a clotting disorder, or morbidly obese, or have a history of cancer, or any, heaven forbid any active cancers, you're at a greatly increased risk of blood clotting as well. And so if you're having a big surgery, you don't want to travel home on the same day, or even immediately thereafter, without talking to your surgeon about it first and seeing what they want to do uh, to help prevent you from getting blood clots. For something like a breast augmentation, the rate of blood clots after a breast augmentation is very low, and it's a commonly performed procedure that people travel long distances for. And the typical breast augmentation patient is pretty young and has very low risk of blood clotting. So her question, traveling two hours to get a breast augmentation, very common. Should she stay at a hotel or not? Well, it kind of depends on the patient. If a patient's a kind of a nervous person and really worried about a complication, they should probably stay at a hotel. The safer thing to do is to stay at a hotel, and some surgeons want to see breast dog patients back on post-operative day one to make sure there's no hematoma forming, which would require a return to the OR. It's blood collecting inside of the breast pocket. Uh, that'd be unfortunate. That's the most like worrisome immediate post-operative complication. But typically when you travel for surgery, uh, and when patients travel to see me, I like to have them stay uh, at least somewhere where I can see them in person with, uh, within one week, at the one week post-operative period. And certain surgeries I'd like to see them the next day. A breast dog is a good example of one where it's nice to see the person the next day to make sure they're not having an immediate complication. But typically I will require somebody to be in Atlanta one week post-operatively. If that means they drive home and come back, that's fine as long as we're not doing an abdominoplasty or a tummy tuck and they are lower risk for blood clotting. I don't want somebody in the car sitting for two to four hours after a surgery if they have a high risk of blood clots. Okay, so let's go see what else we have. So here's a good question. This is from u slash free noise 9104 and her question is, do you need plastic surgery to repair diastasis recti? For those that don't know, diastasis recti is when your rectus abdominis muscles in your stomach come apart and separate a little bit. The most common reason that this happens is because of pregnancy. Your body has to accommodate the growing baby in the womb, and one of the ways it does that is it separates your abdominal muscles, your six-pack muscles, if you will. A lot of the time, they come back together after pregnancy, but they don't always come back together fully. Almost never do you see somebody with completely flat abdomen after a pregnancy. Um, it's just not really how it works. But some people, they come so close together that they are not a problem. But typically, when you get a rectus diastasis and the abdominal muscles are apart, they bow out and form a little pot belly. And you've probably seen somebody who is a, a skinny, otherwise healthy woman who has a little bit of a pot belly, but not really a lot of fat. That's probably rectus diastasis from having a child. Uh, other, th other people can get it. Guys can get it if they're very obese and then they lose a lot of weight. The interabdominal fat pushes the rectus muscles apart and they don't always come back together. So a diastasis recti repair we do as part of a tummy tuck where we will actually sew the muscles back together with a very, very strong suture. Um, and that holds them together and flattens the stomach out. It's part of the tummy tuck. Her question, I am getting so many conflicting messages about diastasis recti. I have a one finger gap just under my rib cage, otherwise it's closed. So what that means is that she can take one finger, put it just be below her rib cage here, and feel the, the edges of her muscles. Um, you can also do it just above your belly button. That's how I like to feel for rectus diastasis. You put your fingers right just above the belly button, right in the midline, and you could, should be able to feel a bulge on either side of the rectus muscles, especially when you bear down and tighten those muscles. That'll give you a good idea of how much diastasis recti you might have. She's wondering if there's anything you could do about it that's not surgical. The answer to that is kind of. So obviously, if you build up your muscles around it, the muscles will look more in line. The thing is, the fascia, it's the fascia that doesn't come together. And what fascia is, fascia you can think of like a painting, like a, the canvas that people paint on. It's a really thick layer of connective tissue that overlies your abdomen. It holds everything together. It's not actually the muscles that hold it together. It's the 
fascia that holds it all together. And that separates a little bit. That's not going to be improved by doing exercises, but what will improve is the bulk and tone of the rectus muscles themselves, which when they become more bulked, uh, larger and more toned, um, can look more centralized. Uh, so yes, it can be improved with exercises, although people with two centimeter or more diastasis, it's really rare that that can be fixed with exercises alone. Um, and then the responses to that are uh, talking about some people on Instagram who have a lot of postpartum exercises that can help. Um, but typically what you need to do to fix it is surgery. It's uh, part of a tummy tuck. Some people don't need a tummy tuck. Some people just have rectus diastasis. If you do, there's a couple ways to just fix the diastasis. You can make an incision directly in the midline of the abdomen, open it up and close the, the rectus muscle. Although that leaves a nice vertical scar right there and otherwise probably pretty good looking abdomen. So we don't preferably do that. For simple, just rectus diastasis repair, for women who have don't have extra skin, don't have extra fat, but just have diastasis repair. Those are the three things, by the way, that make an abdomen look bad. You can check that out over here. If you just have the rectus diastasis, what you can do is you can do a mini tummy tuck incision at the bottom of the, of the abdomen. It looks like a C-section scar. It's about this long, uh, maybe 15, 20 centimeters long. And you lift up the abdomen, you make a long tunnel right on top of everything, and then you sew it back together through that tunnel. Uh, and it leaves like a small look, C-section looking scar. So you can do that. That's one of the ways to fix it. Okay, this is a good question. This is posted by U slash ST2348. Tubular breast correction, implants versus natural. What she's talking about here is a tuberous breast deformity where the lower pole of the breast is constricted and the breast tissue herniates through or pushes through the areola. It makes a very conical, abnormally shaped breast. It's not very full, it's very uh, tubular. That's what a tuberous breast is. There are a number of ways to fix this. But her question is, I've been looking into tubular breast correction surgery, but I really don't want implants, which is pretty common nowadays, especially with all the negative press that implants have gotten over the last couple of years. Does anyone know or have experience with natural breast augmentation, which she says in parentheses, liposuction fat to place into the breasts to fix tubular breast? So, the traditional way to fix a tuberous breast deformity, there's a couple of special things we do. Traditionally, we use an implant, and the, and the reason we do that is because tuberous breasts tend to lack volume. Most women want a larger breast along with their tuberous breast correction, and they want a fuller, rounder shape. And the way to do that is if you put a breast implant underneath the breast and it pushes up on the skin. That'll cause it to stretch, which the problem with a tuberous breast deformity is a constricted lower pull. That means the lower half, all the skin underneath the nipple is very tight and taut, not well developed, and that's what's causing all the problems. So if you put an implant under it, that skin will stretch over time and you'll get a normal looking lower pull of the breast or lower half of the breast. The other trick you have to do is you have to do something called radial scoring, where you're basically using an electric knife, a mono uh, electric cautery or some other method of during surgery, scoring the inside of the breast. And that basically allows it to expand. We're cutting the constrictive bands that, that have occurred with a tuberous breast deformity allowing the skin to do what the skin likes to do when it's under pressure, which is to expand and stretch. So that's a traditional way to do it. Now, I'm a patient who doesn't want an implant, and that is fair because there's a lot of things that go along with having an implant. You're basically required to have another surgery at some point in your life, especially if you're young. There is a risk of breast implant illness, which is a, a uh, developing and emerging thing in our field um, that you can find all over the internet, people talk about. And you can also, uh, there's not so much a risk of breast implant associated cancer unless you're getting a textured device, which we're not really doing much of anymore because of that risk. But some people just don't want a foreign body in them or they don't want to be that large. An implant is definitely not for everybody. So for somebody who doesn't want an implant, you still have to do the radial scoring, but instead of using an implant to allow the breast to expand, what you can do is breast fat grafting. So fat grafting, basically the way it works is it's the other half of liposuction, is how I like to think about it. So traditionally liposuction with a hollow metal canister, you remove fat from an area you don't want it, and we would throw it out in the past. Now more and more we're realizing that that fat and we can use as kind of like a sculptor's clay. In other words, we can add it to different parts of the body to create curves and shapes that the patients want. In this case, a different shape to her breast. So what we would do is we would 
perform the radial scoring, usually through an incision in the inframammary fold or the little fold underneath the breast. Score the breast, or uh, in this case, we could also go around the nipple, a periareolar incision, which is the actual traditional way to do that uh, surgery. And you release those constrictive bands and then fill the breast with fat. And then that fat, half of it will live and about half of it will not live and will be removed. But you still gain some volume in the breast after fat grafting. The downside to it is you can't just fill the breast with fat all in one go. So let's say I liposuction a liter of fat out of somebody's abdomen, which is really easy to do for most people. You now have a liter of good fat you can work with. Well, let's say you wanted a breast augmentation and I would normally use a 400 cc or 400 milliliter implant to achieve whatever the patient's desired goal is. Let's say that that was my recommendation. If I were to take 400 milliliters of fat, from my 1,000 and put it into a, a small breast, most of it would die and it would leave something called fat necrosis. Because you can't just put in as much fat as you want, you have to put in as much fat as the tissue can support. So, in a small breast, it's a small amount of fat. You put some fat in, don't overdo it. Think about, um, one of my mentors uh, talks about uh, the fat being like a lifeboat. If you have a life raft uh, and your ship is going down, you have a lifeboat. The lifeboat goes into the ocean and you fill it with people. The boat can hold 16 people. You can put eight in and eight will live. It's fine. You can put 16 in. 16 will be fine. If you put 18 in, all of it's going to die. Everyone is going to everyone is going to drown. So you really can't go over that number. That number is kind of arbitrary. It's kind of hard to determine. It takes some experience to figure out where that is and how much is too much. But in general, you just can't overdo it. And so the way we do it safely is we do multiple stages. We do this multiple times. The thing about a tuberous breast deformity, we would have to do it three to five times, depending on how many. Uh, how the patient is, how the patient, uh, what the patient's goals are, and how constricted there are. There are very le varying levels of tuberous breast deformities. Is it better than doing an implant in a single stage? For some people, yes. If you really don't want an implant, or you've had problems in the past with an implant, or for any number of reasons, then yes, that's the, it's a good option for people. But you just have to be ready to do multiple stages of it. For most people, though, who don't mind having an implant, an implant is probably a better way to go about it. The other thing is the implant will stretch the skin more than fat can because you can't put a massive bolus or big glob of, of fat in there enough to stretch the skin without having a lot of the fat die and causing fat necrosis, which is a real problem. It's an awful result. It's terrible when that happens. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this little... Um, little reddit session we're just talking a little bit about reddit questions answering them um i might do more of these i may not let's see if people like it um if you want anyway a little bit more about me uh my main hub for everything i am located in atlanta georgia my main hub for seeing everything that i'm doing and getting in touch with me and kind of seeing my work is all on Instagram. I'm at Dr. Thomas Segopian on Instagram. I post everything there first. It's a good place for plastic surgeons to post stuff. It's a very visual medium and visual platform. Uh, I am also on Reddit all the time at the r slash plastic surgery and r slash reduction subforums. My name is Dr. Tom P.S. Feel free to send me a message. People message me all the time on Reddit asking me questions. Um, and I'm always happy to engage with everybody. Uh, my other platforms, I am on YouTube. I am Dr. Tom Hagopian on YouTube. Uh, and you can check out all of my video content there. I post up everything, including explanation videos, what I think about different procedures, some Reddit Q&As. This video will undoubtedly be on YouTube. And also um, procedure videos. So I post a lot of my procedures up on Instagram, and I've uh, started to turn them into full-length videos, or nine, ten-minute videos of just the highlights of me doing a procedure uh, so people can see how it's done. Um, I think people like it. It's kind of helpful, and uh, hopefully it's entertaining to some people. So yeah, anyway, take care.